First of all, I, <coughs> when I excuse me, when I moved down to London, I uh, took up a residence with with Doug, Doug Binder, who, as I said, had been at the college before at Bradford before me, but he went on to the Royal College, and uh, by the time he was finishing at the Royal College, I came down to London and shared premises with him, and um, and we hit it off instantly. You know, we're in good friendship, and. Uh, Sometime later, uh, Dave Vaughan turned up on the scene, who uh, was also at the college the same time as myself. And uh, we talked about getting shared premises a different, different to the ones that we're already in. So we moved across town to the north, further north London, and got a studio together. Uh, but it was the kind of t at the time, we didn't have much in the way of finances. In fact, it was just a huge empty studio with no furniture <laughs> and uh, we had plans but no money uh, so first thing we did we bought a couple of, a couple of uh, cane chairs and uh, the odd chest of drawers and uh, it was kind of the place was so dull and empty that we thought well we might as well we're artists we might as well paint the furniture we've got so we painted the chairs brightly with bright colors and things and uh, and having painted them we looked at them and thought well people may may want these you know they may be you know, we could sell them. Um, and we found that was the case, uh, cut a long story short, so we started buying more and more of these second, second hand furniture and uh, pine chests of drawers, stripping them down and painting those. And uh, and then the stores became interesting. Well, the, fir the very first commission, um, it turned out David Bailey had a studio directly opposite ours. And we used to sort of see him coming up the road in his open top Mercedes on a regular basis with all these glamorous models in the in the back here you know, on a summer's day and we'd be kind of young lads hanging out of the window straight in our necks sort of jealous as anything and uh, but it, the thought occurred to us maybe he would like one of these chests of drawers and very naively we just thought well if we if we leave it on his doorstep in the middle of the night and it's the first thing he sees when he opens the door in the morning he's, he's going to want it you know and uh, that's exactly what happened uh, he he uh, sent the, his cleaner came across and said, uh, David wants to buy the chest, uh, you know, if you go across uh, later in, in, the, you know, in the morning, there'll be a check waiting for you. So we're, kind of, we're all very nervous and sort of trying to draw straws, who should go and knock on the door. So and it, I drew the short straw, or what have you, and uh, I went across there and uh, Catherine Deneuve opened the door, because that's who he was married to at the time. And she opened the door in this negligee, and and I'd seen so many French films where they, you know I thought this is like with the just like the French films is going to be I could see this scenario where I I finish up in a menage a trois with David Bailey and her, you know, too many French films of course like she just gave me the check and shut the door, you know, so uh, you know life doesn't imitate art in that way, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so and it just snowballed from there, and the, the the stores, the major stores in London all got interested in the painted furniture and we got this and the tabloids did we had publicity everywhere and the stores started buying and even the american stores in canada and ogilvy's in canada macy's in america bon marsh in brussels so they were exporting them and so that was really taking off just to, to initially just the painted furniture and we just thought well let's we'll paint everything we possibly have the opportunity to paint so i suppose we were forerunners of the graffiti artists in that sense you know we were taking it was the first art of the of the sixties, uh, you know, the, the swinging sixties thing was already happening, but we were the first to take it out as street art, as such, and we got commissions. The first commission was to do um, the facade of um, Wolf Orleans, which is now one of the biggest advertising agencies in in the country, if not the world. And uh, but at that time they had a small studio in Camden Town, and we did the the front of that, um, and it went from there, as I say, from furniture to the fronts of facades of buildings to uh, to painted cars you know we start thinking well we, you know we'll start painting cars now you know and uh, um, and we'd have painted everything we, we'd have painted the, the pavements and the the, the, the streets and anything we could you know in mean, uh, if the opportunity never arose and uh, with the cars we thought well we couldn't expect anyone to take the risk of having the cars painted uh, so we thought well We'll, buy, we'll purchase our own car and then paint that and hopefully that will entice someone else to have theirs done. So we bought this uh, uh, huge 60, 1960 Buick 
just because it had so much kind of surface area to paint on. And uh, and it was still, at the time, it was still all this kind of uh, fairground kind of imagery. And we also went to see uh, a guy called F.G. Powell in, uh, down near Battersea, and he was, because he was, we discovered through a bit of research uh, that he was the, uh, the guy who was responsible for 90% of the fairground art in this country. And uh, so we thought, well, let's go meet the master, you know, and uh, lovely, assuming, unassuming little old fella in, working in a, a lock-up garage in the back street in Battersea, you know, and uh, in his brown overalls, you know, his khaki overalls, looking like a caretaker or something. But he, uh, he, was, he was wonderfully obliging and showed us all the kind of techniques that he used and various things, and uh, so he was kind of an influence too, you know. And with the cars, I mean, we just, uh, I think we, I mean, we approach the cars and most of the things differently too. I mean, there, there's lots of people who've done customised cars ever since, but they always tell, you know, they, they always tend to take the bonnet, the bonnet off the car and the, or the hood or what, and the, the boot uh, and the doors, they take everything off and treat them on the flat with airbrush and treat them like a separate pieces of artwork, like a, on a drawing board. But we kind of painted them you know, on, on the actual body of the car, because we wanted to pay respects to the lines of the car, so we kind of get into on the shape of the car and wanted to reflect that. Yeah. I mean, what, what was the process, I mean, going back to techniques, what was the yeah. pr process, I mean, was there a particular, you know, type of, because um, obviously the lines and the design on the car was, it was really, like, geometric and yeah. really, like, sharp lines. Yeah. So, I mean, how, how did you go about doing that? Uh, well... Doug and I had a, we'd had a grant in those days at the art college. Um, there was kind of a big emphasis on technique. I mean, like every student, if it's part of his foundation, you had to learn how to uh, uh, do, do heraldry and uh, coach painting and all that kind of thing. So you had to learn all these different brush techniques. So we could, we could you know, we, we got the skill to be able to do that. Um, but we also, uh, we... We put so many coats of gesso on the car, on the, on the furniture, everything to begin with. So we made our own gesso, put lots of coats on, and it's a bit like kind of plaster of Paris. And then with sandpaper and then finer and finer sandpaper, you just kind of sand them down till it's almost like glass. And then, uh, and then we'd use, uh, for the straight lines, we'd use masking tape and things uh, in some cases. And then other areas where you couldn't use that, we'd, we'd, what you'd call the the sidewisers would call you cut a line, which you'd use a very long a brush with very long bristles and you just lay it on and it's just a technique of dragging the bristles along, keeping a very straight line. And the main major uh, aspect was the gradation. I mean, Doug and I could, uh, we could, you know, gradate paint far better than you can with a, with a airbrush or with a spray, you know, uh, just by hand. And it's just a technique, really, that... Uh, uh, and and uh, Dave Vaughan, he, he never did any of the painting or any of the design. He was more like a manager. Uh, well, the other artists, uh, they never kind of uh, showed any direct influence. If there was any influence, it was indirect. But the, uh, I mean, for instance, when we had a show at the Robert Fraser Gallery, I mean, Peter Blake would turn up and uh, David Oxby, Alan Davy, and uh, uh, Palazzi, you know, various various people like that would turn up and uh, discuss what we were doing and things and you know we all felt part of the same scene at that time it was you know uh, yeah the things were buzzing and there was there was a lot of kind of cross-pollination but it wasn't kind of on a very conscious level much smaller tighter more intimate scene at that time yeah i mean uh, you know when i talked about to people about having sort of lived with the beatles and sort and and sort of stayed at uh, Townsend's place and met so many of the musicians. Um, it, I wasn't alone in that. I mean, there were, there were, you know, most musicians knew most artists at that time and vice versa, you know. Uh, and it's like now, I mean, whenever they have 60s exhibitions, they had one at the Tate Gallery in Liverpool two or three years back. And uh, when you turn up at the openings, uh, it's the same sort of 40, 50 people all friends, but they were, you know, you realise that they were the people responsible for the, for the 60s, you know, I mean, there wasn't kind of a horde of people, it was just 40 or 50 faces, and, you know, they, 